Hey everyone, welcome back to this chess video. So in this one we have a recent game of mine, it's just a regular rated chess.com game, but there's actually a really cool concept that I wanted to share and this game does a really good example of explaining that concept. So that concept happens about halfway through the game, but I'm going to show how we kind of get to that point, and then we're going to actually show this really important concept. So that concept is basically reinforcements in chess, which sounds crazy because like both sides have the same number of pieces, the same number of pawns. So like how could one side have reinforcements and the other doesn't? You know, it sounds like you're adding pieces. This is not crazy house variant. This is not bug house variant. Um, so we'll show you exactly how we do this and what I'm referring to when I say that in this chess game. So let's just get started. So in this game, I start with pawn to d4. My opponent plays pawn to d5 so far, so good. That's all pretty normal stuff so far. And I play the queen's gambit, so I don't mind. If, if they play like e6, that's the regular decline, that's fine. If they accept, that's also okay. You know, we have repertoire ideas for regardless what they do. Um, but instead, they decline with what's known as the Slava defense. They played pawn to c6, fine opening. I used to play that for years myself, so, you know, I'm familiar with this from both sides. I play knight f3, which is a fine developing move, helps control the center. My opponent does the same with knight to f6. So far, we're playing pretty well. I play knight c3, pretty common stuff so far. And then the pure Slav defense, the regular Slav, would be bishop to f5. And that's exactly what my opponent plays. So now um, that they brought the bishop out, I'll capture on d5. And they'll recapture with the knight, which is so far so good. Like, this is all okay stuff. Um, I now play queen to b3. And this is where a lot of players, they don't know theory, might start to go wrong. Because I'm adding more pressure to the central square, d5, and I'm actually attacking the b7 pawn. So this is actually very difficult for them to try and hold. And it's actually not so obvious how you defend both of these threats. Now, if you know theory, which my opponent apparently didn't, because um, they thought a few seconds on this move, um, which tells me they probably didn't know what to do. If you know theory, the best move, according to opening theory, is to play queen b6. And neither side really wants to trade. Because if they trade, that helps white get a half-open A-file for the rook. And similarly, if white trades queens here, then that helps black get a half-open file for their rook. You know, so neither side really wants to do that, even though they would have doubled pawns. In this case, the doubled pawns aren't really a huge deal. And I actually kind of like the half-open file. It kind of makes their rook tied down. You know, like if I had a half-open file here, you know, this rook kind of has to stay on A8 because that's to defend the A7 pawn. And it's not like they have not there and it's not like they have knight to c6 because you know there's a pawn in the way so you know it's not so easy to actually hold this without creating more weaknesses um but that's a little more nuanced in this opening um if both sides know theory it would probably go something like knight takes pawn takes back and then white would capture on d5 to try and win a pawn they play e6 white would come back and maybe then we would see a queen trade and then the game would continue and you know white is up a pawn but Black has some development, and white has these doubled pawns in compensation for their half-open A-file. So, you know, this is all very theoretical. I've actually gotten in this exact position several times, including over the board. Um, so, you know, it's a fairly common position if both sides know theory. But my opponent did not know that, apparently. And they tried to play knight to b6, um, which the computer doesn't like too much. They consider that a mistake. And the reason why is because it, even though it saves their knight, which was added pressure to and by moving it here it also kind of interference it defends their b7 pawn the problem is i can play pawn to e4 and i'm already gaining space you know and the center all in all in one move so that's something that generally they'd want to avoid now instead of knight b6 i just want to show for a lot of beginners or even intermediate players they might make the mistake of playing a move like pawn to b6 and pawn b6 is actually a positional blunder because the problem is you've now weakened all of your dark squares or sorry all of your light squares on their queen side and so you can might actually strike with a move like e4 and if they have to like move their bishop back hypothetically you know then i just get the knight with the fork and if they try and get rid of their knight first you know, try and save the position. I don't actually have to take that back. I can take their bishop. And this knight is not doing so good here. It's actually very hard for them to get it out. Maybe they can retreat back. But white has a really good position. There's many good moves here. I could even add pressure to this if I wanted to. There's also developing bishop g5. And really, black is the slightly worse already. Um, so, you know, that's a common thing you see a lot of intermediate players play. Not actually too good. But back here, like I said, in the actual game, they tried knight to b6. And so I played e4, and they play queen, or sorry, they kick my queen with bishop to e6, which actually the computer thinks is actually the best move here. 
And this might look a little bit strange for black, especially if you're kind of a beginner to intermediate player. You're taught you don't want to be blocking your pawn with a piece because, you know, that restricts this pawn from advancing. And that's true. And not only that, but it kind of entombs their bishop, you know, so this bishop can no longer get out on this diagonal. So generally speaking, it's a good open principle trying to avoid putting a piece right in front of your pawn. This is one of those rare cases where this is actually an exception to the rule, where in this case it actually works. And the reason it works is because, first of all, they're attacking my queen. So my queen has to leave. You know, I can't just ignore this threat. And in addition to that, they can actually fianchetto the bishop. And so the fact that this pawn is blocked, they actually don't want to move that pawn anyway. And if they fianchetto, usually you want to leave your pawn here. Because if you advance it to e6, now you have weakened squares again. You know, very similar to what we saw here if they were to play b6 and weaken their light squares. In this case, if they were to have their bishop fianchetto here and they play the pawn to e6, now their dark squares are weaker, even though they still have a bishop on g7. So that's a lot more advanced, but that's some of the reasons why you actually don't mind blocking your pawn with the piece here. And it's actually the best move so far. So in this moment, I have to decide where I put my queen. And my two options, really, the two candidate moves I consider was queen to c2 and queen back to d1. And in the game, I thought, well, I kind of want a little extra support to my d-pawn. And so I actually brought my queen all the way back. And I thought that was fine. Now, looking back, and the computer confirms, queen c2 is actually best. Um, the problem with queen d1 is this pawn doesn't really need support. You know, I've got my knight on it already. It's okay. And I'd much rather have my queen on c2 off the back rank, you know, so it can help me keep developing pieces. In addition, you know, I'm also looking at this pawn, Defending that pawn might need defense later, or I might even advance this pawn in the future, and now my queen on c2 is actually looking all the way down to their king side. You know, maybe I can put the bishop on d3 or something. I already have a battery on h7, especially dangerous if they castle. So all that was very long term, but it made a case that maybe queen c2 is actually slightly better than all the way back to d1. But the game did continue here, so they play g6, trying to fiend shadow because their pawn is, you know, blocked by this bishop, which is fine so far. And I want to get castled, so I play bishop to e2. They do fianchetto, bishop g7. I castle, and now they play bishop g4, which, again, is the best move according to the engine. Now, it might look strange that you've shuffled this bishop, right? You, you developed it here. It was on c8. You put it on f5. Then later you brought it back to e6, and then now you bring it all the way back to g4. It looks like you're losing a lot of tempi here, but each time they moved the bishop, it was a good move. And similarly here, it's best. So why can you shuffle your bishop so much and it's okay in a position that looks like it's fairly open? And the reason for that is because all of those moves were very forcing. Like when it was on e6, it was directly attacking my b3 queen. So I have to react to it. And now here, the difference from when it was on e6, the position is now changed. Because before they had to chase my queen away. Now that my queen is chased away, they actually would love to take my knight here and remove this defender of the d4 pawn. And now my center is actually looking kind of weak, perhaps even falling apart. So my opponent is pretty good in the fact that they realize the position has changed, and now their bishop might need to be on a different square. So that's a really high-level idea my opponent found, and, you know, they're a good player. So, you know, they come up with this kind of stuff. But now I have to defend my d4 pawn. So I decide to play e5. That way this bishop is no longer attacking d4. I'm gaining a little bit of central space. And maybe long term I can actually try and make use of some of those dark squares. Even though their bishop is still guarding them on g7. Um, so I advance to the center. It looks pretty good. And my opponent probably should have castled here. Um, I think most people would realize it's a regular move. But if you're not so concerned about castling, which I think you should be. That's a very good opening principle you don't want to neglect. But if you thought castling wasn't a big deal, you might start considering other moves, like maybe they could try and develop. Like maybe they could bring this knight out, you know, get that into the game. Maybe they could try and fight for the center with like f6 and try and contest my advanced e5 pawn. The problem with this move, which is actually what they played, is that it weakens their king. And both of us see that this diagonal is now weak. And so it's not really a huge deal because I thought I couldn't take advantage of it. They thought I couldn't take advantage of it. Probably because this knight is guarding the square. And the bishop would probably go there in a lot of lines. To try and give a check or some kind of control over this entire diagonal to their king. However, what I didn't see, and probably what my opponent missed too. Was that I can actually take here. They take back. And now I play queen to b3. 
And it's the same idea, you know, as bishop c4, but there's obviously no knight on this square. And now this entire diagonal is just controlled by white, and it stops black from castling. And if they can't castle, their king is just stuck in the center. So this would have been actually a really good opportunity that I actually missed in the game, and my opponent also allowed, so they probably missed it as well. Um, but instead of this, because we both missed it, I played a regular developing move, because I didn't see that was a way that I could break through. I thought they were going to castle, and I couldn't stop them. So I just developed with bishop to f4. And it's a fine developing move. We can see from the engine here that I'm ever so smidge better. It's basically equal, but I'm slightly better still. So I haven't blown the game, you know, by continuing to develop. But I missed a really good opportunity. I could have been slightly better. So this next part of the game, the next few moves, both of us played very aggressively. We both missed stuff. And the computer kind of hates it. They're like, oh, missed win, missed win. That's a blunder, you know, and all that stuff. But when it's back and forth, you know, if both players don't capitalize on the previous mistake, it's not really a huge deal. And so we actually see that coming up because my opponent, after thinking a bit, they actually play pawn to h5, which is aggressive, yes. And they are advancing, especially when they want a castle. You know, so that's kind of dangerous to say the least. And what makes things worse is they've already advanced this c-pawn, so castling queenside is a bit more dangerous as well. So they don't really love castling queenside. I think they would be better off just castling kingside and accepting the fact that a few pawns have advanced, but playing h5 is way too risky, most likely. Um, maybe if this pawn was back on c7 and they could castle queenside, that'd be great. But the problem is this one little pawn move, that small advance, now these diagonals are now weak for your king if you castle on that side of the board. So that's something that they had to be aware of, and maybe they sense the danger or underestimated it, but for whatever reason, they played h5. Um, what I think they should have done is follow through with their plan and capture here, I take back, and then they're trying to fight for the center. You know, they can capture here, I capture back, you know, maybe they can trade queens. The game goes on, and this is about equal. You know, I haven't really gotten much, and they're trading things off, and maybe then they can keep developing, and it's just a regular game. So, you know, something like that could have been an option. But it, the game did not go that way. I didn't see that. And so I just played h3, which is another missed opportunity because this is a very common pattern where when they have a pawn here, if I want them to get rid of their bishop pair, oftentimes I'll want to play h3 because normally they want to keep the tension. They want to bring their bishop back. And they can't bring their bishop back because this is controlled by their pawn at the exact this exact moment. So because of that, usually h3 is a good way to exploit this and kind of force them to take. Now, the problem is, after I play h3, um, you know, maybe they actually want to take, you know, I was kind of, like, we mentioned this before, they had bishop here, takes back, and they're fighting for the center, you know, the line that I just showed earlier, where you take here and you trade. But the thing is, I'm helping them, because by playing h3 here, I'm actually provoking them into playing a move they want to play. So that's really a bad judgment call on my part. I really shouldn't have played h3. Um, looking back, I think instead of h3, I should have just kept developing. I really should put the queen back on c2. That's where it probably belonged to begin with. And now it's even stronger because this pawn is actually under attack now that they've pushed this other pawn to h5. So in this case, that would have been a really good find that could have saved the game for me in some sense. Um, but instead, I play h3 and provoke them into playing a move. Unfortunately, they want to play. So now my opponent does not do that. It's a very back and forth middle game, like I said. They get very tricky and they play g5. Um, obviously, they're attacking my bishop. My knight might get under attack. You know, this pawn is attacking their bishop. There's a lot of pieces hanging. It almost looks like a Tal game. You know, the difference is with him, it's some really genius sacrifice. And here, we're more or less just missing things. <laughs> you know, that's the difference between us and the Grandmaster. But in this case, it's still a very tricky position. Tricky enough that in this game, I actually didn't handle it perfectly. Now, what I did on this move, which I think is correct, is I accept the bishop. So that part is okay. And yes, they do open the h file when they recapture back, um, but I'm up by two right now, you know, because I got a piece for the pawn. So, you know, I'm up material. If I can hold this, I should be fine. And so right now, this bishop is attacked by their pawn. Right now, this knight is attacked by their pawn. And so I can't save both. And so the move that I should have played was I should have just sacrificed my knight here. And they take back, I get the pawn, and I'm still up by a pawn, but they're not really castling kingside. I mean, their whole kingside structure looks really shattered. They have, like, no home pawns here. You know, this, these pawns are all gone. Um, this pawn's technically up the board, but it might as well be gone. I mean, it's not helping their king in the least, you know. So, really, their king is no shelter. Long term, this is completely lost for black, I think. Um, but, unfortunately, the game didn't go that way. 
um, because I didn't find that move. I thought, I'm up by two. If I can hold this, even if we trade into an endgame, I should be winning. And so I just played knight back to h2, which again, I think is a missed opportunity. I'm still okay, and I'm still a smidge better, but it's not as good as the crushing position we could have had. So they do take my bishop, I take here, and now the game continues, which it's roughly equal. I'm a smidge better, but not by much. So they try and fight for the center, and now this is the moment where I don't want them castling, so I want to stop them, even if it's not a big deal, and so I play this check first. That way they have to move their king, and then they lost castling rights, and now I can forever attack their king. Now, a slight missed opportunity for me again, and I promise this is the last one, I think, um, is bishop to g4, which is what I played. I think that's a mistake. Obviously, I just wanted to save my bishop because I don't want my queen babysitting all the time where it has to be, you know, defending it on h5. So I just get the bishop out of harm's way. Maybe I can even play bishop to e6 in some lines and threaten some kind of mating net if I can get the queen to f7. You know, something like that or some ideas. Um, but I think better than that was to actually just bring another piece into the attack. Bring another piece closer to their king with queen g4. I think that was a stronger way to continue here. But the game does go on, you know, with bishop g4. And by no means is it the end of the world. So they grab on d4. And I'm down by two. But, you know, their king is very open. So I have compensation for this. You know, it's still a pretty equal game. I play queen c2, which I should have played a long time ago. You know, when I should have, you know, not retreated back to d1. But it is what it is. So now this is actually a very hard threat, I think, for a lot of players to see, because this next move is a lot more dangerous than it looks. So the threat here is for white to actually just play queen to f5 check. And that might not look too devastating at a glance, but that's actually a really annoying check that black has to defend against. And so if they see that check coming, probably the best defense for that is to play queen c4. That way, when I give this check, they can just block with their queen. And black right now is up by two points of material. So white does not want to trade queens, right? You know, black is up material. If they can trade, their king is fairly safe if the queens come off the board. They go into an end game and black is better because they're up material. So that would have been a way to try and hold on with more or less equal position. But instead of that, my opponent tried to defend a different way. They tried to play queen d6 with the idea that if I try giving this check now, now they can block on, you know, the f6 square. But the difference here is, unlike, you know, when the queen was on c4, the difference now is I can actually play rook a to d1 and gain a tempo on the queen while it has to move. And so they try to play here, you know, to guard against my check. Uh, the engine actually thinks it was better to play queen to h6, you know, and maybe you have some kind of attacking pressure on my knight. Um, and the game does continue, you know, it's, it's, but it's very imbalanced, you know, so they have a very exposed king, they're trying to counterattack on my king. You know, and at least there's chances for both sides to mess up. So now this is the position where I really wanted to discuss about the whole concept of the video, reinforcements in chess. So how does this work? So both sides in chess have the same number of pieces, the same number of pawns. And so how does reinforcements actually help us win the game? Because that was actually a really instructional point in this game. And arguably how I was able to actually win this game was because of that one concept. So the concept is, even though you have the same number of pieces and pawns, not all of them are always active. This is why it's important to keep developing your pieces. In this case, black has these pieces undeveloped, still on the queen side, and this knight on b6 is also kind of out of play. It's developed because it's off the back rank, sure, but it really needs to be defending their king. And their king is so exposed, and this knight is way on the other side of the board, it's going to take way too long for it to get there. And so if white, the attacking side, if they can keep up the pressure, they keep giving threats, especially checks, very forcing moves. That means that they have to react to those moves, and without the initiative, they don't have time to develop. So it's very important in this position, especially the fact that you know white is down by two points of material. It's very important that white keeps the pressure, keeps attacking, keeps giving checks. That way, they don't have time to develop the rest of their pieces. Because if these pieces are undeveloped, then they might as well not have them. Like, you know, this rook is out of the game for the time being. If I keep giving checks and attacks and forcing moves, it's almost like they're not up by two. It's almost like I'm up by three because this rook is out of play. Um, and, you know, you could argue maybe similar to this knight. So really, they have to get all their pieces into the attack. Um, and I'm going to try and stop them from doing that. Now, very similarly... While I'm doing that and, you know, keeping the threats coming, I also want to be bringing more of my pieces into the attack. As I basically try and cut off their reinforcements, I want to be bringing my own reinforcements. 
And generally speaking, if I have at least two more attackers in pieces than they have defenders to their king, usually you can force a checkmate or some way your attack breaks through. So right here, they have two defenders to their king, maybe the rook in some lines. So that's like two or three. And so higher than two, let's just say two defenders. So higher than two, that would be four, you know, four, right? Two more than two is four. So I would need at least four attackers to break through. I would need at least five attackers if you count this rook as a defender. So that would be three defenders. I'd need at least five attackers to break through. Now, if you count how many pieces I have for the attack, I just have this bishop. Maybe the queen is sort of eyeing these squares. I don't have four or five attackers. You know, so I need to bring more attackers if I want a chance to try and win this game. So there's a few ways to do that. Um, one good way is I could bring my knight to the king's side with a tempo attacking the queen. You know, knight e4 is a good move. Um, but there's also another move here. And so the other move is I could actually play this rook check. So I play rook d8 check, fully anticipating the only legal move, of course, which is king f7. So I have to have an answer to this. And so my answer is I can actually trade an attacker for a defender. I don't mind trading here because I should have enough pieces that I can still convert this. You know, they have two defenders to their king. So two plus two is four. I need at least four attackers. So how do we get four attackers here? Well, first of all, I need my queen in. So I'm going to play a queen with check. And it's very important that this is with check, because if I play a silent move, if I play a good move, like say queen e4 and slowly trying to creep to the king's side, that's too slow. Because all they do is they just keep developing. They could develop their knight or something, then get their rook into play. And at the very least, their rook would be defending the entire back rank. So I can't play slow moves like that. I have to play very forcing moves. So next they block with their bishop. They play bishop to g7. And now I bring my knight in. I play knight to e4 gaining time attacking their queen so now they have to move their queen and they don't have time to develop the rest of their pieces so right now the reinforcements are cut off and i'm going to try and keep bringing more and more attackers to their king so my reinforcements will keep coming and theirs unfortunately are kind of out of play for the time being so they do move their queen they want to trade queens because if they can trade queens they're up by two pawns they go into an endgame they're happy i don't want to trade queens for that exact reason so i'm going to move my queen with check another forcing move and so now they're going to block the bishop. And now how do I bring more pieces into the attack? And so the way I thought to do this is actually to play bishop check, the bishop h5 check. And the reason I do that is it's almost like a clearance because I'm clearing this g4 square for my knight. I want to bring my knight into the game. And so I play this check. Their king must move. And now I play knight g4, which also attacks their queen. And so by playing all these forcing moves and bringing more and more pieces to the attack, I'm slowly making more and more progress. And notice now, I really have four attackers on the king side. And remember, we only needed two more attackers and defenders to more or less crash through. They only have two defenders at this point. So I am very happy here. This is really winning for white because we have at least two more attackers and they have defenders. I know it's just a matter of technique to try and find a way to break through with this attack. So next, you know, they had to move their attack queen, so they move queen g7. And now I could try and continue an attack here. You know, for example, I could just capture this, you know, remove my attacker for the defender, and that's a pretty devastating way to continue. But why stop at four attackers, right? I have enough. I can actually play rook to d1, and that's what I played. Now I have a fifth attacker. And so I have five attackers or two defenders. Their king is not going to last long here. Now they try and develop because they're trying to, you know, bring their pieces into the game. And at this moment, I really wanted to play a certain move, and I chickened out. I didn't play the move. The move I really wanted to play was just sacrifice here, and that would have been a really great move. And the reason I could do this is because if I tr take here, I still have four attackers or two defenders. And this rook is sort of defending now because it's got the back rank covered, but it's still so far from their king. It's really out of the game. Like, where can they go? Like, maybe they can try and move their king to the corner and try and get to safety. But I can just remove the defender. They can move back. I don't want to trade queens because I'm still down material. But I can give a check. They move to the corner. And then I can just take here. And I got all my material back. We have three attackers. You know, these three here. And they only have one defender. So, three, you know, minus, you know, the one. That's two. We still have our two attacker advantage that we need to convert this. So white is still winning here. That would have been a better way to continue. But unfortunately, even though I really want to play that rook move, um, I wasn't so sure if it worked. And I didn't really want to sacrifice the exchange with giving up my rook for a knight. You know, so maybe I should have. But in the game, I kind of chickened out of it. And I captured here, which removes one of their defenders. So, you know, it's still a good move. We're still winning here. It's not a big deal. 
but I still want to keep bringing more pieces to the attack, right? Because I have these four pieces attacking. At the very least, we could say three, you know, if you don't count the rook. And so they have two defenders. So how can I bring another piece closer to their king? Well, this knight is on the king side, sort of. But, you know, it's kind of out of this quadrant of the king. I would really like to get it in there. And so a very forcing move is I play knight g5. And this is forcing because it's got a very tactical threat that's pretty obvious. I think a lot of people will see this. I'm threatening knight to e6. And that royal fork, they really have to worry about. So because of that, they don't have time to, like, say, defend by, like, getting their rook over and fighting for the d file or something. You know, if this score was defended, they would love to bring their rook over. But I'm not giving them time to do that. You know, because if I wait, they're up by two. I don't want them to consolidate their defenses. I have to keep their reinforcements out of play. So they have to either move the queen or move the king. Because, you know, how else would you defend against the, the check on e6? So they chose king to g8 here. The engine actually recommends, in post-game analysis, that you should play queen h6. So then, if I try in something like bishop f7, they just move their king to the g7 square. And maybe long-term, you can even bring your rook over to h8 and try and counterattack on white's king. You know, so that was maybe their best defensive try. But white is still winning here. Um, so here in the game, they actually played king g8, and white is still winning as well. But now I come up with this move, which we just saw in the variation, which is bishop f7. In this case, it's with a check. And so they don't want to go back, because if they go back to f8, then this is the same knight fork that we looked at, and they would lose their queen. So my opponent does not want to do that, of course. So they play king to h8 to the corner. And now they have two defenders. I really want four attackers. You know, I have these three are definitely attacking. The only piece that I really have to get in the game is my rook. And so how can I really bring this rook in? Because unfortunately, now that they've developed their knight off of b8, this rook defends their entire back rank. And so it's almost like this rook is no longer really an attacker, and they've sort of consolidated some of their reinforcements. So how can I add this rook into the attack? And so the answer is, well, I can actually do a rook lift. I can play rook d3, and now I'm threatening to make it active this way. And this is actually a really dangerous threat, because my bishop has already taken control of the square. So how do you defend against this? And the short answer is you really can't. Unfortunately for black, this is already checkmate in 7, according to the computer. Um, and so they tried knight g4, which to be fair, the computer does say is the best move. You know, that's one of them. So now it's mate in six. The idea, of course, is that if I give this, you know, rook check, they can try and block with the knight, you know, and prolong things. You know, and I'm still winning, but, you know, it's not so clear in how I break through. Um, but I don't have to play that rook check because they were probably hoping that I would play this check and they could block with their knight on h6. So instead of that, I can just take their knight. You know, I don't have to be in a rush. Sometimes when you're playing, you know, you don't always have to go for immediately for checkmate. You know, if there's a chance to win a piece or a pawn, you know, that could be a successful way to convert your attack. You know, and so here I just capture this. I still have three attackers near their king, and they only have one defender. So we still have at least two more attackers. In theory, we should usually be able to break through with our attack. So now they play queen to f6, you know, trying to hold things together. Maybe clear this square for their king if needed. But now I ha actually have a forced checkmate in three. And so I play queen to h5 check. Their king has to move unless they want to throw away their queen here. So they probably don't want to do that. Um, that would be checkmate anyway. Um, I would just take it and that would be mate in one from there. So they have to move their king up. But now I have queen to h7 check. They're forced back. And now queen to g8 is actually checkmate. And so I thought that was a really simple example in how you really use this concept of reinforcements. But I thought it was also instructional and worth sharing with everyone. Because really, in the chess game, both sides have an equal army. And that's actually kind of unusual. You know, in real life, any kind of faction, any kind of modern war, you have both sides, usually different different weapons, different scale of their you know army, different coordination. There's so many details. I actually love that chess is equal in when you start the game, you know, and is really fair in that sense. So you have to make the most of all of your pieces that you have and keep adding attackers when you have an attack. In this case, I had to keep bringing more attackers or king. Those were my reinforcements. I have to get them active. And similarly, I have to play very forcing moves to prevent my opponent from developing the last of their reinforcements into play. So that is how you win chess games with an attack sometimes. You keep up the pressure using the power of reinforcements. So thanks for stopping by, everyone. I'll see you in the next chess video.